Hey, what's happening? It's Craig Moss. You're listening to Dave and Creech on WROM Radio. What's up? It's Jared Cohn. You're listening to the Dave and Creech Show on WROM. That M stands for murder. Murder people. Yeah. This is is the Dave and Creech Show, the only podcast where podcaster C.J. Creech and actor Dave Sheridan come together to talk all things entertainment with your favorite entertainers. Want to ask our guests a question? Tweet them to at Dave Sheridan or at CJCNOV88, and they may be asked to our guests live on the show. We do have to ask you stay seated during the podcast because this ride may get a little bit hilarious. Now here's your hosts, Dave and Creech. Hey guys, welcome back to episode 26 of the Dave and Creech show. I am one of your hosts, CJ Creech, and while Dave will be joining us a little bit later, I am here currently with your co-host for this week. My name is Brian Daniels. That is weird how that's happening. Yes. Um, but yeah, we had a little schedule snafu, and actually, uh, I wasn't on the interviews this week, so it's kind of it's kind of funny how Dave's not on this part, I'm not on that part. Uh, it's just been a crazy week, topped off with crazy situations, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and and discuss what that is because. Um, I'm not actually on the interviews this week because I had a little bit of car trouble. Car troubles. Car troubles, which is which is weird when I have a basically brand new car, under 50,000 miles. Uh, but apparently, uh, cars need coolant. A little, a little thing called coolant. You know, what What do we, what's coolant for? To cool Your down, car. To cool down the engine. So yeah, well, basically what happened was um, I was actually supposed to be on the interviews and uh, I was going to do them when I was driving, but I leave. Uh, you, well, you were over, you were over uh, my house and uh, you had just left because I had to go deal with some stuff, so uh, you had to go ahead and leave and you had Lexi with you, so I'm like, I'll catch you later. So about three hours later, you messaged me, hey, just got to the McDonald's by your house. And I'm like, wait, what? Wait, what are you talking about? Yeah, keep in mind, guys, this McDonald's is like maybe a three-minute drive away from his Less house. Less than a three-minute drive. So I'm like, I'm like, did you have to walk? What, why are you just by my house just now? I thought you, I had to ask him if he out, did the interview with Dave. He's like, no, uh, I actually had car troubles. I'm like, well, where would you break down at? He's like, yeah, I'm at this Girl Scout building. I'm like, you're talking about the one right outside my neighborhood. Yeah. Basically what happened was as soon as I I left his house to turn on the car, the fan came on. Um, and I was like, that's weird. But I started driving it. And then the AC cut off It's because it's one of these fancy newer cars that tell you exactly what's going on with your car. And so it's like AC turned off to high engine temperatures. And I was like, oh, that's not good. Um and so once again, this is under 50,000 miles, so I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Uh, I get up to the stoplight, which is by the this abandoned Girl Scout which, place, which, which, which is, is, is right outside of his neighborhood. And it, it says, pull over uh, and put engine in idle. So I did. I did exactly what it said. And then it said that it kept ticking closer and closer to H. And eventually it was just like, turn the car off. And I did that, too. So, listen. So, um, I, I let it cool down a little bit, and then I drove it into the abandoned parking lot of this abandoned, closed-down Girl Scout building. And these two angels from above is what I can liken them to. These This elderly couple came and checked on me and uh, followed me. And, and yes, I, I actually don't even know why. I, I, I still can't explain why I didn't even call you. I don't. It didn't even cross my mind. They, like, I was right outside your neighborhood. But I didn't do that. But they followed me over there. I bought some coolant, and uh, the car's been fine. I, it, I think they were waiting for someone to open up the Girl Scout building so they can get some cookies. They probably thought you were there for the same thing because you had your daughter with you. Well, yeah, that, that's possible. I mean, Who knows? My, my whole family on my mom's side is actually very mechanically inclined. Uh, and apparently that gene skipped 
me at least. Yeah, that uh, that tr- uh, character trait. Yeah, I didn't I that, didn't get that. So um, yes, now I know coolant is needed for your car, and I've got some spare coolant now, just in case so this it, ever happens again. So. You, you shouldn't be hearing about me talk about that again. Enough about how stupid I am at cars. And uh, we're going to go to this. Actually, the, the reason I even know about this is because of Brian Daniels, the, the guy that, that's in here. The, he showed me these videos on, on YouTube called List. And basically, if you haven't seen one, all it is is videos of lists, top ten grossest moments in movies, top ten hilarious movie cops. Top ten moments. It's top just... ten movie kills. You know, it could be any and top everything. Top ten anything, yeah. And um, sometimes it's even more than ten, sometimes it's less than ten, but it, it, it always is a list. And these things are really addicting. And uh, one of the first ones I, I saw because of him uh, was top ten hilarious movie cops, where WatchMojo.com actually... Voted Dave Sheridan's role, our co-host, of Doofy, number eight. And, uh, you know, that was really cool, and we we put that out there. Um, And some fans, you know, obviously weren't very happy at the placing of it. But, I mean, I don't have any qualms with it. We'll find out what Dave thinks next week. No, to be, on, to be uh, on the to, list. To be honest, I mean, he, he made it on the list. That's number eight of yeah. all time, in their opinion. I mean, when you think this role of Doofy was 15, 16 years ago, and yet he still made it to number eight, I mean, that, that's kudos, pretty impressive. Kudos, kudos. That acting. But what we're going to do is a little plug right here for our uncensored and extended version of this podcast. We're going to play right now a little bit uh, from what you can hear if you check out the Uncensored and Extended version. Uh, That version airs and is actually released at 9 o'clock, right after this version that you're listening to airs live for the first time. 9 p.m. on Spreaker, SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, any and everywhere, really. Uh, You can listen to an uncensored, extended version of the podcast every week. And, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great listen. So here's a sneak peek, an excerpt of, from that, if you will, of Dave talking about getting into the character of Doofy. And uh, if you want to hear more about it and hear some more stories about uh, his time on Scary Movie, make sure you check out the full podcast at 9 p.m. on those channels that I just mentioned. But I also went in as Doofy. I didn't break character. I was in the waiting room as Doofy. I auditioned as Doofy. Oh, I like love your never, I love that. Yeah, Keenan never met me as not Doofy. You know what I mean? They brought right. me back with the rest of the cast, and I still stayed in Doofy. And then, you know, the, uh, somebody came up from the studio and said, you have to stop doing Doofy. You're kind of freaking <laughs> people out. You've got to show them that you're not. They think that we're taking advantage of, like, a special ed guy. You know what I mean? Like, they, they, can you please tell them that you're not really – you know, totally 100% doofy because they're, I mean, look, I, I'm definitely doofy. There's, I am, I'm slightly special, right? But they sure. wanted to show me that I, I, I could attain a driver's license legally, you know? And so, like, because cause you're upsetting some of the actors, they think that you might, that we're sort of taking advantage of a, of a guy like you. So, so at what point yeah. did you finally uh, become Dave? No, I had, that's when the studio came up at this. It was like the table read, you know. And oh, got, oh gotcha. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Thing, that they gotcha. said, you, you, you know, you got to sort of break character now. Got gotcha, table you're read. Okay. freaking people out. They think that, you know, it's hilarious, but they think that we're taking advantage. of. That's they think we really hired a, a guy. Now, we are going to get into the interviews this week. These are pretty much the majority of our episode this week. Now, once again, Dave Sheridan is doing these interviews by himself with Jared Cohn. And Craig Moss, I wanted to be there, uh, but just remember the whole time this interview is going on, I'm on the side of the road of an abandoned Girl Scouts, just wondering when my guardian angels are going to come and save me from my stupidity. (laughs) Enjoy. Yo, Jared, how are you, man? Hey, how's it going, man? Good. You're on with uh, Dave Sheridan. Creech is sort of on. He's doing work, uh, but he'll, he's going to try to pop in when he can. 
Uh, we just oh. wanted to make sure we got this interview this week because we've been doing a uh, – on the Dave and Creech show here on WROM Radio, we've been doing a one-month sort of uh, blast of the horde, and we're on – Oh, awesome, man. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. You started out – first of all, you're, you're directing, you write, um, you're, you're producing, you're, you're kind of doing everything. I'm, I'm imagining you're still doing some acting roles here and there, but – did, did you break in as an actor? What was? What, how did you get to where you are right now? Yeah, you know, I, I would say, yeah, you know, I, I really want, I was many a moon ago, let's say like 13, 14 years ago, uh, you know, I got the uh, idea, you know, to try to, to want to become an actor. I had a roommate in college. Uh, he's an actor. Um, so he kind of, turned me on to it so I was living in I'm from New York I did like a year or two years a couple years in Boston not knowing what I wanted to do and then you know I met my roommate he's an actor and he went and moved from Boston to LA and I went out there visited him and uh you know he he was doing great he's still doing great uh uh he's actually you know pretty well known uh actor and then so I've you know I kind of followed in his footsteps whatnot and moved out he... here and uh yeah I was just you know i started taking a bunch of classes and i was doing all, all these like student films i mean i did a shit ton of uh student films and taking classes and then uh auditioning I, you know where i was working a bunch in these you know very uh you know little films very independent films and uh luckily i i auditioned for the uh, the asylum um, back in 2003, and, uh, you know, I booked the part in this movie called Way of the Vampire, and then went on to do uh, a bunch more movies as an actor in, uh, you know, these asylum movies, and and then, before, you know, but at the same time, even before my first audition as an actor, and kind of before I started getting to the classes, I, I had, you know, I started writing, and cause I was, you know, I was reading scripts and trying to, you know, do those things. You sort of read those books on acting and, you know, I went through that and started writing and, and I, as I was acting in these assigned movies and, and other student films, not student, not other student films, but student films started and other stuff, I was writing these scripts and script after script. I really got into this, like, hardcore writing and I would just, I've written a lot of scripts, uh, not as many as other people, but more than other people, some some other people. Um, and I had this one script, and I got to know the Asylum producers. Uh, big shout out to the Asylum, much love, because uh, they read what they read it, and they were like, "Oh, we really like this. What do you want to do?" Uh, and I was like, "I want to make it." And at that point, I was, you know, really focused on acting, but sort of, you know, I had I had directed a, a movie. Uh, in between that that period, where after I took out all my money, my life savings, and made this feature film that you know it turned out all right, but uh, I'm glad I did it because when the asylum read my script and they, they wanted to do it, they're like, oh, do you want to direct it or do you want to play the lead? And they were like, well, uh, I was like, well, you know, and then they were like, oh, by the way, we pitched it to Lifetime, and they like they really like it, so we could either make this movie with you in the lead and it'll be a small movie or you you know, you can direct it and we'll put like real names, you know, stars in there. And I was like, and you know, the acting thing really wasn't, I mean, it was going, it was moving along slowly. And it's a tough, it's a tough grind acting. So it was really at that point that I was like, you know what, I'm going to direct this. Um, and that, you know, it turned out really, it did, it did really well. Uh, and now, uh, yeah, now tomorrow I start shooting my uh, tenth, my tenth asylum movie that I uh, will be direct, uh, tenth one that I directed. I acted in uh, uh, probably, I'd say, maybe ten or more than ten or fifteen or somewhere along uh, the lines of that. So I mean, I, I basically the way I got in was I auditioned. You know what I mean? I had a I had an audition as an actor to get my uh, contacts as as a writer director. So it's it's a lot of people are like, oh, how do you get you know how do you get in you know how do you, how do you meet the contacts? It's all about who you know, right? Blah 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 and all that, which is true to to some extent. You know, obviously talent is a factor, 
Um, but some of the most talented actors are waiting tables or, you know, in some community theater in, you know, Wisconsin or, you know, somewhere, um, Oklahoma. But talent is, you know, definitely very important, but it's also about the look and who you know and, you know, and, uh, but, yeah, I mean, I, I auditioned, proud to say that I, I auditioned, so I earned, sort of earned those contacts uh, based on uh, acting ability, which really has nothing to do with, well, it sort of has something to do with, you know, writing, directing ability. It's all hand in hand. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's Everyone has their own path, and my path, you know, you, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of hard to, you really, it's not a path that I guess can be duplicated, but every path is so unique. You know, you ask everybody that's working in this industry, and, and unless they were born into it or unless they were just, someone gave them a lot of money, it's always like, well, I met this guy from film school, and then, uh, you know, I worked as a crew on this guy's shoot, and I met that guy. And, you know, it's always, it's always like, I met this guy, who introduced me to that guy, who introduced me to this guy, and now I'm working on this, this thing or that thing. So it's... Uh, but I would say to all, any aspiring uh, filmmakers or actors or writers or whatever, you really got to, you know, if you really want to give yourself the best chance to succeed, move to L.A., you know? That's where it's at. I mean, uh, if you read the book, great book. Uh, it's called How to Write Movies for Fun and Profit with the word fun crossed out, written by the guys, uh, I think they did this, you know, like Reno, the Reno night, you know, those, those guys, uh, and they write a lot of movies. Lennon uh, Grant. Or, Lennon Grant. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, but those guys are killing it. And their first chapter of the book was like, if you want to work in movies or TV, you got to live in LA. And uh, I would recommend that bit of advice to be true. It's, you know, yeah, it's I unfortunate, it's but. Yeah, I think you're right because the ratio, it's a ratio game like you're saying, and it's like like you said, oh, you worked with this guy, you met this guy, you know this guy. How do you meet these people? How do you get to know them? How do they get to know you? How do they get to work with you? You've got to be in the mix there, and yeah. the more people you work with, the more people you touch in the business, you know, the more social you are in that kind of vein, the more contacts, and one thing will lead to the other. The thing I like about the Asylum, uh, and that's David's company, and I think everyone knows who they are, but obviously they're most famous for the Sharknado stuff now and the Z Nation. But, um, yeah. you know, they're kind of like that sort of, uh, they sort of like filled the gap of the Roger Corman studio stuff. And you know, uh, being a student of the game, how many really talented, famous people came out of Roger Corman's, you know, studio camp. And they sort of emulated a model of what Roger was doing in the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. And, uh, and so for them, you know, it's, you're a homegrown talent within the asylum thing of, of them bringing you back and treating you good. Of Hey, you've acted in some things. You've earned their trust. You know, you went out and directed something on your own, and then you had a good script. What was the one, what was the feature film that you directed on your own you know, with your money, what was that one? It was called. It's called the Carpenter, uh, and then they just uh, the distributor changed it to the Carpenter Part One, and so they die. It was going to be a sequel, but uh, that never happened. So maybe one day. Um, but yeah, I mean, it came out you know pretty good. But uh, yeah, I mean, again, you know, super duper shout out, much love to the asylum, David Romali, David Lapp, Paul Bales, and David Garber. I mean, those guys are just top notch guys. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, again, yeah, it's like, yeah, living in L.A., it's, it's so true. I mean, you could send out a million emails, you know, to producers and whatever, and they're just kind of really good, or casting directors or whoever, and they just, you really got to meet them and be in the mix. You're, you know, you're so right about that. Well, I think you said it there. You said you could send out a million emails, but then that means that they're getting a million emails, you know, and so, like, nobody has time to be, you know, you're going to get buried in your emails when you when everyone has their own. You know, they all they also have their own work they got to do, and they're barely getting that done. On top of having to look at sort of someone yeah, you no, don't know or check that email out. Yeah. Bit of, bit of advice for the listeners. Yeah, I mean, like when you send out, and I, I I thought the same thing too. I thought I can, you know, I can just get make a personal connection and 
somehow connect with, you know, an agent or a producer or a casting director. And I mean, they just get inundated with uh, emails. And it's just, I mean, I, I'm, I'm starting to get like, you know, people sending me their scripts and headshots. And I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, I, I, I got, you know, I, I'm, I'm waiting on, you know, I'm at a dentist appointment in a waiting room. And I'm like, and I guess, you know, some guy sending me his, his script. And uh, it's like, man, I got, I, I'm, 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 not that I'm like, I just don't have the time. And like, a lot of people don't have the time. And it's like, if you don't know someone personally, you know, why are they going to, you know, back you and want to read your script? Because it's not just about the script. The script could be great, but people got to read the script. You know, you got to know the people to read the script. And it's really fucking time consuming, for, at least for me. I know some people can really just crank out a script and read it. But when I read a script, I mean, it's like, it takes me like a good few hours because, you know, I vi- I'm visualizing as I'm reading and right. I, I can't just, you know, I can't just, I can yeah. read, you know, I, if I'm reading a magazine, I can crank it out. Yeah. But if I'm reading a script, it's like I'm visualizing and then I'll be like, well, what's this character? And I'll, you know, if I really want to read it, I'm going to read it and I'm going to spend, and, I'm, and it takes me like, especially if I'm, if someone's like, Hey, I want you to direct this film and, and it's real. And I, and, and I really, you know, I'm, I'm going to spend four hours reading that script for the first time. You know, big shout out to Paul Logan for his script, The Horde, you know, to, to, to talk about, uh, you know, The Horde. He's a fantastic writer. And what's good, what he did, which was really smart, and uh, if, if you're listening, Paul, or uh, what, he, what he's doing, is, which is really smart, is he's writing, he's writing scripts uh, for himself as a, you know, starring vehicle, you know, to act in and... Uh, <clears throat> You know, which is good because you know he got he got it made and, and it features his acting and it features his writing and and uh, you know he, that's a, that's what he did. So well, let's let's talk about the horde now. So I, I've watched it. It's a great. I love it because of the hybridness of it. You know, it's got your sort of uh, hills have eyes, sort of yeah. uh, this uh, you know um, cabin in the woods. What, what do you want to say? Like you know, teens going camping, getting slaughtered. You know, bad guys that. It's got that with and the then Rambo, you've got this you know? action. Yeah, and then you've got this Rambo hybrid halfway through the movie that, you know, the second half is a straight up, you know, hero action movie. You know what I mean? Guy versus a bunch of bad guys armed with a knife, you know, uh, using, improvising with his military background to, you know, defeat the bad guys and then uh, and rescue his fiance and stuff. So it's, it's a really smart piece for Paul. You know, especially yeah, on the exactly. musical level. Like, he wrote something that will speak well to what he does best, but also has a commercial viability in terms of, oh, people love those two types of genres, especially in the foreign market of where you, you know, um, like what Beth and the people that put up the money, they're going to have to make sure they get their money back and to have. It's always important to know that you have some sort of foreign market value of what you're going to do, you know, uh, which comes into play yeah. a lot. And on your directing side, and you've done some other horror movies, a lot of young directors have their uh, – it's good to cut your teeth in that realm of horror. And I'm not quite sure why. I think because you can – there's always a levity of some comedy. There's always a little extremism to it. You get to have some cool effects and blood and guts and some, you know, the action and stuff like that. But at the same time, it tests you because you're shooting this thing in 14 days, 18 days. Uh, and so that's why they get a, y- a lot of young directors because, you know, you, a 45-year-old director, if he's still wanting to shoot something in 14 days uh, on, a, on a budget that's low, he's probably not worth his salt, first of all, because he's, and he's probably so tired of doing it. You know what I mean? Young guys have the aptitude uh, in terms of in the attitude to get it done because it, it benefits them to get movies done, too, you know? So, um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So how I completely, I completely did, agree. How did they get in touch with you? How did you get involved with the horse? Well, I've known Paul. Uh, I've known Paul Logan for uh, many years. Um, him and I, uh, we actually, uh, we're, we were we were actors, and in, in, he was in uh, Way of the Vampire um, uh, with me, and, and uh, so we had met a while back, and then I'd seen him at a bunch of events. Uh, you know, asylum events and parties, and you know, we just became friends. And you know, and then I remember uh, at one point he, he mentioned 
oh, hey, I wrote this script, The Horde, um, you know, you check it out, I'm, 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 and, and then we started talking, and, I, and then, then I saw him again at another, you know, another event. So it was sort of an organic process, uh, and then by the time he's, you know, the financing, uh, you know, he linked up with 313 Films, and, you know, the movie was m- moving forward, um, you know, he, and he had seen some of my films as a director, and uh, you know, and he was came up to me and was like, "I, you know, I'd be interested in and in, uh, having you as a director." And so he introduced me to you know Beth and, and the producers, and luckily, you know, we, we we got on really great. We had this, you know, the same same vision, and and uh, it happened. You know, you know, blessed enough, blessed to uh, to get the tap. On the horde, what what you know? What was the most difficult scene to shoot? Uh, I mean, you know, you've got the car chase, big car chase stuff at the end. You've got your torture porn scenes. You're in this, you know. There's large group scenes in the woods. What what was the most challenging on this film? Just because of you know the other things that you know were involved. Just the bottom line budget practicalities, locations, all that other stuff that came into play with each one of these type of aspects of the film. What was, what was something looking back now going like, uh, you know, that was challenging. It, it challenged me as a director that I didn't, I never had to do something like that before, or you, I didn't even, I didn't think we'd pull it off, but we did. Um, yeah, I mean, two moments, you know, I think, you know, were, 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 were challenging. One, was in the you know opening movie we had you know we had a lot of extras and we were running you know the clock was ticking and we got to get these you know the group of mutants running after uh, and you know we didn't we, you know we didn't have time to make them all look you know super badass so you know we were just we just had a you know shoot it was a little bit frantic you know we were under the gun but I mean we got it so we were like all right let's stylize it let's silhouette it you know feature only. Uh, you know, the guys in the front, and we're lighting people on fire, and we're, you know, hanging people upside down, and doing car chases, and, you know, filming on a moving, you know, speeding car, and having a fight in the back of a pickup truck. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's you know, if you have a day, a, you know, a full day to just shoot that, or, I mean, big movies, you know, shoot a car chase sequence in, like, three days, you know, in two units, or, so, when you have, 15 days, literally, you know, uh, it's tough. Yeah, but uh, did that, this is what will arm you for later on to be that, you know, when you get that Guardians of the Galaxy shot or some Marvel yeah, thing. Yeah. This filmmaking it doesn't change at the bigger levels. It actually, you know, you become more of a CEO. You're really handling giant departments at that point. But if you don't know how the X's and O's come together and the dominoes and – how to build that tree fort. You're not going to build a skyscraper if you can't build the proper tree fort. You know what I mean? So it, it, it comes into play at the end of the day. Uh, nobody can jump right into being a CEO of these $200 million movies without understanding, you know, the, the basics of filmmaking that, that come, you know, the rigors of it. So but what's up with – will there be a Horde 2, the Horde 2? Is that going to happen? You know, can't. I, 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 hopefully, that's, that's what. I'll, hopefully, uh, I, you know, I'm ready. You know, it's. Uh, you know, I, I know Paul. You know, we're, there's no script. I believe as of yeah, I know Paul has some ideas, and uh, but hopefully, I mean, I guess. Uh, hopefully, the movie will do well, and you know, and financially, they can. You know, we can roll roll into Horde too. I, 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 I'd, I'd love to do that. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's like, I don't know about the, the Hills Have Eyes and the same plot, but it's really Crenshaw. You know, I mean, like, like, like any other action movie, the continuation is the characters. You know what I mean? The world of their characters being... So it would be, you know, it's more like, what is Crenshaw's next adventure, really? You know what I'm saying? Uh, it probably, you know, it could go anywhere as long as he's... <clears throat> as long as it's true to his character and where his character might end up being, you know? Whether it's a diehard thing or a Con Air thing or whatever it might be, you know? So... Yeah, um, no, exactly. Um, uh, well, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready for it. What is going to go on with this uh, Leonard Skinner biopic thing? Uh, that's pretty damn cool that you're going to be doing that. 
Um, how did that come about? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, where did you where did you hear? Where did you read about that? Or uh, I don't remember. Maybe a little thing called Rolling Stone. Maybe they <laughs> mentioned it. All right, all right, cool. It's well, yeah, pretty just, big uh, news, especially down here in uh, uh, North Carolina. You know, we we I, yeah yeah no, the it's only fine. place that has like Simple Man on on a uh, heavy rotation. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's such a great song. Um, well, yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, well, you know, it was just a, uh, you know, super, you know, super awesome that, you know, that came, came about, you know, uh, I mean, it's just to be a part of, uh, you know, it's like rock and roll history. So, um, uh, you know, I can't say too many details. A lot of it is, uh, you know, I probably, you know, the, the producer is, they're keeping everything, you know, sort of under wraps and I know, you know, so, but, uh, I will say that, it will be sick, you know, and uh, I'm going to do my best to, you know, tell that story as best as I can. And it's such a great story. I, you know, the the pleasure to hang out with Artemis Pyle and, uh, you know, just to hang out with him and get, you know, and get the story. I mean, it's just an insane story. And, uh, you know, I'm working on the script uh, and, uh you know, doing a lot of, so, you know, it's a big undertaking because you want to tell it right, you know, you don't want to, you know, it's a, sort of a responsibility, but if, you, if it's a true story, you know, if you're writing, uh, you know, a thick, a, a good action movie, whatever, you know, you can, but this was, you know, this happened, and <clears throat> people died, and, uh, you know, and so, it's, you know, it's, you want to make sure, you know, it's, it's, it's handled, uh, you know, well. Hey, dude, thank you very much. Let's, uh, let's keep in touch. Awesome, man. Well, thanks so much for having me on. And, uh, uh, yeah, definitely. I really, I really appreciate it, you know, really appreciate it. Uh, this is the Dave and Creed Show when we've got Craig Moss on the show. Many of you might know him as the director of the three-peat of the Bad Ass and Bad Asses, Bad Asses in the Bayou. Um, what, what were the three... The, those three badass movies called badass badass first one was yeah right? first one was badass second one was called badass two colon badasses and then the third one which was you know the the big mac daddy of them all was badasses on the bayou it didn't even get the badass three moniker it was just badasses on the bayou you did not get the um did, were you able to sort of get some sort of uh bastardized rendition of a Creedence Clearwater song on that? <laughs> we, 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 we tried, but we ended up getting a local, uh, a local Baton Rouge band that put together something that sounded like it. So, yeah, it was, it was, it was still damn good. You know, we were Yeah, that's of, what I meant. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you're, you know, I mean, even, even the biggest movies aren't, they, they, they barely have the budget to afford a Creedence song. I mean, those guys are taking top dollar. You know exactly. You, you, that's exactly. the funny thing is now you've made a lot of films. Do you find it when you go after music? Doesn't it blow your mind? Like like oh that Jefferson Starship song is that expensive? What the fuck is that about? Right or something like you know it's like you can imagine like uh, Enter Sandman, Metallica, or yeah. some sort of ACDC song. Okay, I get it. That stuff was super popular. I can see how they're asking top dollar. But when you're talking about you know, uh, a Gary Glitter song or something even more, you know. Um, well, we, we, we try to get a, we, on the last movie I did, we tried to get an Eddie Rabbit song from 1982. Right. And it was like as if we were going to buy, like, a, a, a track from Abbey Road. It was, like, the most expensive thing. And it was like, are you kidding? It was, like, more than the budget of the film. Yeah. It's Is insane. Eddie Rabbit even alive? Uh, it's a good question. I hope so. Is he a rabbit? I, I hope to God he is, because, you know, we're all big fans. Yeah. I wonder if he was like, you know, the Roger Rabbit, or, you know, like an Eddie Rabbit. Right. <laughs> or, I think it wasn't spelled like rabbit. Was it? Maybe we're saying rabbit, but maybe he was rabid, like a rabid dog. Eddie, Ra Eddie Rabbit would be the good punk rock version of only covering Eddie Rabbit songs. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. That's actually Eddie a great, Rabbit. I think somebody is touring with that name right now. So, 
I think your Eddie dream Rabbit? is reality, my friend. Jeez, Louise. Yeah. That's, you know, this is what I do. I'm in the zeitgeist, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. Um, so, so, so how did the first badass come to be? Did you write that film? I did. Um, the, the, it's, a, it's a very kind of cool story the way it happened. Um, so apparently there was this incident that happened up in Oakland on, a, on a, the, one of those transit buses where there was an old man, probably 72 years old, huge gray beard. I mean, he literally looked like Santa Claus, huge gray beard. He's like six foot two, um, kind of a strong guy, wore a fanny pack. He wore this powder blue shirt that said on the back, I'm a motherfucker. And he wore these like basketball shorts and old like Nike high tops. And he was sitting on the bus and he got into an altercation with this younger African-American guy. And um, which you can see this video, by the way, on, on YouTube. It's called Epic Beard Man because they ultimately called this guy Epic Beard Man. So who's the old guy? So the old guy, um, some words were exchanged. The two of them um, got into a little heated argument. The old guy decided to move to the front of the bus. And there were a couple girls in the back of the bus who were recording the entire thing on the iPhone. And they said to the, uh, the younger African-American guy, you're not going to take that. You've got to go stick up for yourself. So <clears throat> the young guy goes up to the front of the bus and goes out again with the old guy and then threw a punch at the old guy. And then the old guy just went nuts on the younger guy, knocked him out on the bus, and he was bleeding just like profusely, and uh, basically yelled at him, I told you not to fuck with me, and then hopped off the bus. So, and, he more, and he more than told him not to fuck with him. He had a shirt. He said, I am a motherfucker. You, know, like you would think from that moment that he would have just like not even have gotten involved with him, but he didn't read the shirt, obviously. So, yeah, now it's questionable whether the guy could have read in the first place. I don't know because mm-hmm. you're screwing with someone in the back of the bus, a senior citizen, and he, when he moves to the front of the bus to get away, but then you notice the back of his powder blue shirt says, I'm a motherfucker. <laughs> well, you know, and, you, and, and, he, and he's still sporting a fanny pack and, and post, you know, the year 2005 or whatever. You figure, uh, well, this dude – you know, is is ballsy enough to put that on a shirt and a powder blue shirt at that. Right. So he might be able to back it up. Yeah. And, and he proved that he did, right? He he took care of that thing. And so from that video came out the idea of what would this guy's world be? What what where where you know, what if we were following this guy's sort of adventure, what would that be, right? Yeah, yeah, because apparently what because once those two young ladies who recorded on their iPhone hooked it up on YouTube. It got like a million, literally like a million views overnight. It was like this huge internet sensation. And so the producer that I had worked with on a couple other films prior to that called me up and said, you got to check this out. And I looked at the YouTube clip. I'm like, oh my God, this guy's unbelievable. This is unbelievable. And so we ended up um, thinking that we could sort of inspired by that incident come up with this sort of senior citizen who, you know, wasn't gonna, was basically going to right all the wrongs in, in, in society and stand up for himself. And it was sort of like a modern-day, like, Death Wish sort of concept, with, you know, the Charles Bronson movie. And, right. and, and Danny had come off of doing machete. He likes to say the way he pronounces machete, which I, I like to say machete, but he says machete. And so from there... Um, he was he he loved the idea of playing a um, of because the character is a Vietnam vet and he loved the idea of doing that and and supporting the troops and and um, and we wanted to get behind that as well so we kind of created the story around that concept right yep and 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 then the rest is history he went on to make three of these movies uh, they've been viewed by hundreds of millions of people by now mainly via the Netflix is where everyone has really been exposed to the majority of it, I would imagine. Correct, yeah. I don't, think, I don't think there's ever a time that I don't log on to Netflix and see that on some sort of one of my suggested playlists, you know what I mean? Even if it's in the kids' animation or family-friendly, it's like, you may enjoy uh, Badasses in the Bayou. Uh, right, five-year-olds, might... love, they love to watch a good ass-kicking. They, they, they right. enjoy it, so... 
I don't know. I don't know what who they paid at Netflix because that thing is lined up in like family comedies, or right. you know, and it's next right. to like it's like it's next to Santa Paws yep. and Pinky Dinky Do and Badasses in the Bayou, you know. And it's like, what, what, wait a second, none of these, you know, and the Bernstein Bears. Yep. Like, how, what do these have in common? You know, I guess Trejo might have voiced one of the Bernstein Bears, who so somehow the algorithm still lines up badasses. The guy is sort of this, you know, he. He's he is the Mexican Kevin Bacon of cinema. You know, I mean, he's done <laughs> yes, like 172 right. films. So the six degrees of separation. You know, he's definitely two degrees of separation uh, on Netflix. You know, he's. You know, I think he's, he's like a half. One... A deg- I think he's like a half a degree of separation. I think everybody's been in a film with Danny. So I've done. Yeah, I think I've done two or three. And, Have you? Uh, he's a pleasure to work with. He's amazing. Um, you know, obviously, Devil's Rejects is the more formidable one that we had a great time on. But Bubble Boy was, was also a I – lo- I like the fact that we're in Bubble Boy because that was Danny doing something that was really off of uh, – not in his wheelhouse. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you're talking about a, the guy from Con Air – and Machete and Devil's Rejects and Badass and Badasses, et cetera, et cetera. Like, these are all movies that fit his thing. And then next thing you know, you're like, oh, wait a second. He's the love interest of Swoozy Quartz, Quartz, whatever, and and Bubble Boy, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, you know, he's actually very funny. Like, you can put him in these situations. He, He plays it great. Yeah, and, 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 you know, and that's the thing is Badass is, the Badass trilogy has tongue-in-cheekness to it. Sure. And, you know, and so what led you to this new project that you're doing with Danny, which is what we're on to talk about, because you have an Indiegogo, actually, I just saw you have an Indiegogo thing that just launched, and that's why I reached out. I go, I've got to have you on. I, what the heck is this thing? Cause yeah. It looks like this was like, what the fuck is this that you're doing now? I mean, you concocted something pretty crazy. What, is it? It's called Social Security. Is that what it's called? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's called it's called Social Security. And uh, thank you though for that intro. That was very. <laughs> you've set the, the film up really well. I, here's what happened. So Danny and I were doing. Um, you know, in the last two badasses I did with with Danny Trejo and Danny Glover. And there was a very, really fun thing about these old guys that are, like, arguing with each other, kind of the old grumpy old men sort of mentality. Right. But, exactly. You know, so the, that, that sort of chemistry was a lot of fun to work with with the two of them. But then also these guys that come together to kick ass and, and, and beat the crap out of people that are, you know, bad people. And so Danny was turning 70 years old, and we were talking about – that aspect of it and kind of joking around that maybe, you know, that he'd be in a retirement home or assisted living home pretty soon. And, and, and what if, what if we did a film about, about that concept and somebody breaking in and he would kick the shit out of everybody. And we were jokingly saying, but then, but then as we kind of thought about it, we thought how cool would it be to have this sort of diehard concept in a retirement home where, you know, some, 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 bad people break in trying to take advantage of some people that are pretty, you know, wealthy and have some, you know, high stakes welfare and, and Danny's there visiting a friend and, and, and has to, has to save the day. But the difference, what we wanted, what Danny really wanted to do, Danny wanted to play himself in a movie. He wanted to play himself as the lead. So he's Danny Trejo in the movie. And so the concept was for him to do this, but also, use what he's learned from all the action films he's done for the last 30 years and apply that to, like, kick ass and save the day. Right. I love that. That's a really funny idea. So there's really two hooks to it, actually, because it's Danny playing Danny himself. Right. He could be, he could, Danny could be caught up in any action movie, you know, like, oh, Danny, Danny's down at uh, wherever. You know, he's out with his son at a – at a, uh, X Games and something happens, you know, but, but, so you already have that level, but now, you know, that's a unique one to set it in an assisted living or what you want to, a simple way to say, an old folks home. Right. And, uh, and have like the older people also helping fight back, et cetera, et cetera. And just some, a lot of funny gags there. Yeah. Uh, now, now going back to Danny being 70, by the way, is that sort of blows my mind that that guy is 70 because of, you know, 
you know, I know good black don't crack, but goddamn, the Mexicans, they, they, you know, he, he's got that thick head of hair. It's black as hell, and you know what I mean? And he's yeah. so yeah, he's, muscular and carrying some muscle tone. And so for like, I, I, and all the physicalities he's done over the years with the movies, you'd think that guy would be feeling his age. But, uh, uh, you know, he's in great shape and uh, great energy for a 70-year-old, man. I hope I can be that, that way. Yeah, well, I think uh, – those, those Tito, ta- those, those. I'm sorry. Those Trejo's tacos that he eats definitely helps. Like, he definitely. It's, it's a lot more of a healthier diet. But I, he, that guy on set is amazing. Like he'll go all day, all night, barely gets any sleep, and he still gets involved in a lot of the stuff that we do for these sort of action filled scenes. Now he's got a stunt double, obviously, but. He will take it as far as we need him to take it. And there's a lot of physical stuff that, that kind of goes on, and the guy is up for anything. And he's amazing. He really is amazing. Uh, I, I like the idea that his stunt double's just his brother. You know, it's my brother, uh, you know, um, what do you want to say? Miguel Trejo. It's my brother, Miguel Trejo. And he's 72. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> it's just like, right. it's just like yeah, exactly. I, just, I just get the break Danny no. had. But, no, uh, he's, the cool, no, he's 67, I, so he's three years younger, yeah. so. He's got a little more. He's got a little more yeah, to exactly. him. Exactly. You know, and he has to, yeah, he just has to slow it down a little bit to really sell the stunts because, you know, sometimes I watch that and I go, that was clearly a 67-year-old doing this. <laughs> right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, we had, we had, there was a moment in uh, Badass is on the Bayou where both Danny Trejo and Danny Glover had to, there was a, uh, the bad guys came in with some gunfire and they had a dive behind some barrels. And so Danny Glover saw his stunt guy do it and said, oh, no, 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 that's not how I do it. Let me show you how it's done. And he gets up and he does it, probably does it at like 20% of what the stunt guy did it at, but regardless made a point to do it anyway and proved that he was very true to his craft and was going to be very authentic to the stunt. So... These, sometimes these older guys, they don't, you know, they won't rely on the stunt guy. They'll go ahead and do it themselves. I, I've had that experience myself on set where, where there'll be a stunt guy doing something where it's like, okay, I've got to get picked up by this, like, giant dude and slam down on this desk. But, okay, Dave, we've got your stunt guy. He's going to do that. Okay, great. And then they'll, they'll shoot the stunt. All right, he's going to pick him up, and he's going to slam it down. Holy crap, that looks hard. They really threw that guy on the thing. And they're like, all right, now, Dave, you get in there because we need to match the shot. So our, our close-up is going to be you getting grabbed. And the, and the, but the thing is this, you're working with some professional wrestler guy, and he just goes and grabs you and throws you down on the desk too. It's like the same <laughs> stunt, but they're calling it matching. And I go, well, you know, I'm kind of really doing the stunt actually. And and I didn't even, you didn't even think to give me like the back spine protector thing, <laughs> you know, right. like the scorpion. Speaking of the ribs, because we we talked about me with the broken ribs right now, I'm this dislocated rib and. Yeah, because it happens. I've, I've, I, I do tend to do my, most of my stunts myself, but even when you – and the reason why I just do them is because they always call for, like, let's just match it now, and the guy doing it's actually hitting you and throwing you anyway because you want it to look good, but you're pretty much doing about 75% of that stunt, you know? So, yeah, yeah, um, they, 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 they so, disguise it with their – they say they're going to match it, but, you know, they're, 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 you're doing the stunt anyway. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. and you're not yeah. even getting the pay. And then, so so um, going back to Social Security. Yeah. So you've written you you've actually written the full script. You went and just you went it and and it's on your own. You just did that one on your own. You wrote it, no co-writer or what's anything like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wrote it, and then what happened was we, um, we, you know, Fox, 20th Century Fox, who did all the badass movies, were going to. Uh, get involved in it on some level, but what ended up happening was they kind of shut down their lower budget production uh, division there. So Danny and I were like, okay, well we gotta we gotta get this film made, and we gotta figure out how we're gonna do it. And so we were people were told us about the crowdfunding, and so we thought well, it would be a great idea um, to get you know to get people and fans involved in the movie making where they can be a part of the movie making and see the film that they want to see as opposed to, you know, a lot of times when you do it through the studio or other production companies, they cut out some of the best stuff that you want to be able to include that the fans want to see. So 
this made a lot of sense to us on a lot of different levels. And so um, we kind of set out and created this um, uh, campaign to, to get supporters, to, to you know, the, the fans and, and the people to back the project. And, and, and they get, and people that do that, I mean, the concept is, is that the people that back and support the, 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 the project will get really cool things, like really cool perks or rewards, depending on, how, you know, how much support they give it. So they can get anything from, you know, having lunch with Danny on set to um, being in a fight scene to um, uh, having a couple lines in the movie on camera um, you know, I, there's cool T-shirts to get, posters signed by Danny, DVDs, advanced digital downloads, just a bunch of different things that are really cool um, for for being a part and supporting the film. So it, it was just a, it seemed like a really fun thing to do. And again, having the support of fans and, and people is something that Danny and I, you know, thought would be kind of a cool thing. I like. I think you should double up that one and say and. Ha- having lunch with Danny while fighting. Uh, <laughs> that should be well, that, that should be like, oh, if you want to you move it up, you know, yeah, you get the T-shirt, you get the DVD when it comes out, and you get to have lunch. Oh, and the next one is, yeah, you get the T-shirt, the DVD, and you get to have lunch with Danny, and also you, you get to fight him while you're eating. Not You, you don't even wait 20 minutes, you know. <laughs> you don't even wait 20 minutes after you ate. Right. And they're Trejo tacos, by the way. Yeah, you know, of course. Lunch will be, you're going to have your... your uh, Trejo Tacos. Uh, I've never been. To, now that's an actual restaurant, right? It is an actual restaurant, um, and it's it's uh, in Los Angeles, um, in like the near the Mid Wilshire area, and it's very it's amazing. The tacos are amazing. Are there uh, lower amounts that they, people can can contribute on on this uh, oh, Indiegogo? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, okay. there are, it starts at ten dollars. You know. It, right. it, and it goes it goes up to 20 to I think 25 30 35 50, you know it just goes up from there yeah. so yeah if somebody just wanted to donate ten dollars uh, for, so for the cost of two Trejo tacos right you can get in you could be a part of this you can get a great reward and know that you were a part of like whoa I helped make this you know epic social security movie which I think you know honestly like uh I feel like this, I want to see this movie. It feels like the natural progression of what I want to see Danny Trejo be doing. You know what I mean? I think he's going to be poking fun at himself a little bit more in this, but at the same time, it's still going to deliver on the action stuff, and it's a really unique way to get into Danny doing what Danny does, but also servicing, uh, you know, a... Serve, I'd want to say a typical, you know, action movie because it's in a so, but you know, like you said, it's Die Hard set in a Social Security or a uh, assisted living home. And right. by the way, with all the baby boomers, and we know how Social Security is running out, we this is actually a very socially poignant uh, um, talk piece of you know elders and you know how will we be taking care of our you know senior citizens in the future because of the way our sort of money is going and becoming worthless in America and stuff. It's sort of like it is the, the it's up in the air of like, is social security even going to be around for me? You know, right. I mean, I'm only yep. a few years away from wanting to use it and I hope it is. Cause I want my, you know, bitch better have my money. You know, you know, that poem, that, that nice famous poem from I'm going to get sucker. You know, <laughs> of, that, of course, that's yeah. the way I look at, that's the way I look at government with my social security. When I turn 65, that check better be coming. Otherwise, I'm going to be sitting there on Capitol Hill going, bitch, better have my money. Where the fuck is it? I paid it. You know what I mean? I I see it being taken out of my check every week. I see that little thing. And some of the other things, I don't even know what they stand for. You know, apparently I'm playing scratch. I'm giving money to scratchers or something. (laughs) Right. There's there's all sorts of Navajo, Navajo code talk going on on my paycheck at the bottom. I don't understand what some of this stuff, FICA, what the hell's a FICA thing? You know, I thought that was like my credit score. Right. You know? That's the feminine I'm, version of your, of your credit score. Exactly. I, yeah. I yeah. didn't know if that was like, you know, some sort of Swedish tennis cue or something like that, that I'm all of a sudden giving, I'm giving into every, every month, you know, right. Like, what the hell happened there? Right. Um, I can only imagine that's So that's why I stay married. Uh, because, you know, man, being divorced, and I would never get divorced anyway. I love my wife, but I, I'm just saying, uh, 
it's definitely a, a deterrent when you look at like uh, how much more you got to pay out, out the pocket once you do have to, you got your, you know, divorce is not a cheap thing. So it's definitely not something I hope people stay married and work their differences out. And, uh, and hopefully this social security movie will make many Amer- happy marriages as they well, watch that, it. And love that's it. the point of the film. We want people, you know, whether they're having marital problems or not, to come and see the movie, and if they do, it's going to keep them together. What is the amount that you're trying? What is your goal on Indiegogo? Um, right now, the goal is set at two hundred and twenty-five thousand. Um, and you, what's that? And when did you launch the, the Indiegogo? We just launched uh, the other day. We just Literally, launched. we just we just like went live, so it's like brand new. So I was very excited from your invitation to have me on your amazing show um and and kind of just get the word out so, so well get the word out then like what what is the what do you know the address or yeah you know here's the best go thing go here's the easiest students? way to do it if you go on to um indiegogo.com which is you know the main sort of website for the for this crowdfunding thing so it's i n d i e G O G O. That's I N D I E G O G O dot com. And when you go, when you when you arrive there, just go under the search and just search um, social. Uh, excuse me, Social Security, the movie, and then it'll it'll come up. So if you just put Social Security, the movie, under the search there, it'll automatically pop up. You'll 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 look. There'll actually be a picture of Danny holding a gun. And you can just click on that, and then it'll take you right to the page. Got it. Sounds simple enough. I mean, you definitely don't want to just Google Social Security and donate to that because you'll probably just be, you know, just actually donating money straight to the real Social Security. So that, you know, hey, you might actually found, found a way to, uh, for people to accidentally save our real Social Security. That would be hilarious if there's some news story. It's like there's an uptick of, a wave of people just donating to Social Security. <laughs> like, yeah, I was, exactly. I thought I was trying to get the Danny Trejo movie made. You know, what the hell? Yeah, um, well, it, you know what? We're, we're trying to, I think right now with this film, it's, I think we can give a little bit more back by, by putting together a, a, a great movie that, that, like I said, it's only going to keep marriages together. But it's, the, here, the great thing about this movie, too, also, Dave, is, it's going to be a great action film, first and foremost. For foremost, and, and I think the bottom line is with Danny, as you said, there's these little one-liners and little sort of tongue-in-cheek moments that Danny plays really, really well that kind of sort of underline the movie. Because it is an action film, first and foremost, the, the comedy kind of just kind of is, is highlighted a little bit. He plays it well, so we're, uh, we're excited to get this up and going. So... Indiegogo. When does this thing run till? You're you're on Indiegogo. Yeah. Film is Social Security. You're tr- you're 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 doing a crowdfund. Got some great rewards. How, when does it all end? Or does it? I don't it even never, know. It never ends. Goes. No, it does end. We we basically we're up for about thirty days. But the idea is to, um, you know, get it get it sooner rather than later, just to you know, um, keep things going with it. But yeah, we're up for. We're up for uh, 30 days, and as I said, we, we just went live, so we're, we're kind of uh, at, at the very beginning of it all. And then once you raise the money, how quickly would you be able to just go shoot? Or is this just sort of like this is sort of a, a seed money to then get it going even further? What, no, no, work? we would um, – we, the idea would be once getting the money that we would start – uh, pre-production, uh, the end of the summer, and then, you know, shoot at the beginning of fall. Awesome. Yeah. We're not, we're not playing around. We, we, this movie, we need to get made. And uh, that's, we're being, you know, very, very sort of proactive and, and um, aggressive and trying to keep to a schedule with it. So that's, that's the plan. So I'm hoping you're available then. I will make myself available. All right, just don't break any ribs or vertebrae, for God's sake. I won't even tell you when they're broken. I went in. I went in for a thing. I'm not going to say what I went in for today, but it was very physical, and and they had me do this. I had to audition for for this role, and I was doing it like six times, and 
and it was like they I had to fake that I was riding on this runaway golf cart and going over potholes and potholes and jumping and and jumping like a you know a construction site and stuff and landing and I was just it was killing me and they're just like uh, you know uh, and they were trying to match us up to other actors so they're like Dave would you come back in again and I was like oh my gosh <laughs> this is you know but I but you want the role. And then right. I told my daughter, I was like, you got to lie. You, you never tell anyone you're hurt. You know, you don't tell anyone. I had a broken shoulder when I shot a scary movie, and I had to, um, and, and it was, I broke it like the week before we started shooting. I couldn't tell anyone I had a broken shoulder. I had to go to the doctor and have them tape it up every, oh you know, at the beginning God. of the week. And I had it taped every, like, Sunday and just tried to keep it taped during the week because that's what kept it, like, from hurting a lot. And, um, but at the same time, I already told them I'm right-handed because they made this, like, the, the thing that the killer wore, uh, it opened up with all these, like, cleavers and knives and stuff, which I think we only used in one scene, but we constantly had that same thing where I could open it up with my left hand and kind of select what murdering tool that I was using with my right hand, and that's the, my right shoulder is what was broken, so I was constantly killing people and stabbing people with this effed up shoulder. It really oh hurt God. a lot. You yeah. would never, when you watch that movie, and, 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 and if people watch the movie again now and look for that, you would never notice that. You might, you might the one thing you might notice is the right shoulder being a little bigger, because I was wearing like a brace with tape, so it uh. might be a little different looking than the 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 left one. If that's about the only way you would notice something like that. You know what I mean? So um, you, by the way, I, luckily it's all it's those those shots are mostly at night or in a house and darkly lit. And I'm wearing black, so a lot of that, you know, like you're saying, you can't notice what's really going on. So, well, you were you were uh, you were hysterical in that, along with everything else you do. So you know, I'm a huge fan of yours, and and. Uh, why we got to uh, we got to do this we got to we got to make more films together yeah and just just speaking of stunts to end on this since we're talking about the scary movie and my character that was my first you know real movie where i did a lot of uh, opportunity to do all my stunts and and i didn't have to play Ghostface in the mask that that was something i kind of demanded like i was cast as doofy and i said i'm only going to do the role if i get to play the killer that I'm representing at the end of the movie because of the physical humor that I knew I could bring to the character right. hiding behind the couch or hurting his back in the Matrix thing, et cetera, et cetera. But because of that, I also did almost every stunt. The only two stunts that I didn't do in that movie were running down the stairs with the piano chasing me down, and then at the very end when she kicks me through the glass, uh, that, those are the two. That was on like a decelerator cable that pulled the stuntman out of the window through the window in a, a box, you know, a bunch of boxes and stuff like that to catch his fall. I didn't do those two, but I remember I was doing so many stunts, and they had a stunt double, and uh, they took, the stuntmen took me out to lunch uh, about halfway through the movie, and they took me out to lunch, and they said, you know, um, just, just so you know, is this your first film? I go, yeah, and he goes, so you're doing your own stunts? I go, yeah, you know, I kind of want to be like Burt Reynolds, do all my own stunts, et cetera, et cetera, bring a lot to it. And they go, well, let, let, me, let me tell you how it works. See, we make our money when we do the stunts. So when we're not doing a stunt for you, we're not getting paid. But we're also the stunt crew. So when you're doing your stunt, you're relying on us to be safe. So, you know, when we're not making money, that make, make it to the point where, you know, we can't guarantee that your stunts would be safe. So do you understand where we're going here? So they kind of shook me down. I love how, he took, I love how he took you to lunch to tell you that too. Like yeah, that was definitely the full shakedown, like, Mob style oh. intimidation. Oh, by um, the way, when I say they took me to lunch, it wasn't like at some Italian restaurant. It was at like a Taco Bell drive-through. They told me in the car. Oh, you know, did it in the after car. You did it Goodfellas style. Somebody's gonna yeah. shoot from behind near your head, like Pesci. I got it. Yeah, it makes I think sense. it was like you know, you know, what do you want, Dave? You want in the, you know, they were paying, they were buying me to lunch in the drive-through, <laughs> but it was like, you know, it was a little like, uh, okay, I'm in the car. I think they just wanted to be somewhere where they where no one, it wasn't on set, and no one heard them kind of give me the shakedown of, right. this is the way it works, we're doing the stunts. That's amazing. Because we got to get story. paid. And we're also responsible for your safety, so keep that in mind. And uh, then I was like, okay, yeah, he can do that stunt. Yeah, it's fine. You can do the stunt. Did you, was that your first big gig? Was uh, It was, uh -huh. yeah. 
So, so how was it for you right after that came out? Like the, the for opening weekend, and then oh, yeah. I'm sure everything changed, right? Everything changed because that was like it opened up. I think we beat X Men. The first, that was the first X Men, so we were the week after X Men or the week before, and we beat X Men, and it was you know the number one movie, and it and it broke all sorts of rated R records and stuff. And I was in, it, it just so happened to be that I was in New York City the week that movie was coming out, so it was kind of interesting because I was doing a lot of press on the New York City circuit, which is like, you know, uh, the Today Show and Fox Channel, Fox News shows and CBS, you know what I'm saying? So it was like, right. I wasn't like, oh, man, I, w- I happened to be in like, uh, you know, I was in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I was like, I just happened to be in New York City so that they were lining me up with a lot of press. So it really, it was a one-two punch to be in the biggest city in the world, you know, on the biggest stage to do all the press. When that movie came out, all of a sudden there was a reason why people wanted to talk to me. You know what I mean? So, right, right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I was, like, no doubt, I was young and got cocky and got a big head and thought it was going to be super easy, you know, because I, I think it was like my first audition, too. Are you, <laughs> like, wow. How, how old were you when that, when that came out? I was old, though, yeah, you because know, I had a TV show on, uh, on MTV, Okay. You know, when I was 25. Gotcha. So I think I was 27 maybe, you know. I did the TV show for a couple of years. And then um, I, I, you know, this is not about me. We, you and I can talk about this later on. The, long, long, the short story of the long of it all is I wrote a movie that, w- that was being produced by Dimension Films. And before they greenlit that movie, they said, we want to put you in this movie. So I, I still had to audition, but I was sort of being uh, groomed, and, and the uh, wine scenes were kind of pressuring. They they put a little, like, this is the studio's choice, you know what I mean, gotcha. to, to Keenan. But Keenan would not have – he wouldn't have said – if he didn't think I was the guy, that, you know, it just worked out that they made a suggestion, like, you got to see this guy Dave. He's going to be in another movie for us. And then he's – and then I, I – but I still had to audition, and I, and I went in and just – did what I had to do, and Keenan was like, that was awesome, and uh, you got the role. So Wow. But I also went in as Doofy. I didn't break character. I was in the waiting room as Doofy. I auditioned as Doofy. Oh, like I love Keenan your never, I love that. Yeah, Keenan never met me as not Doofy. You know what I mean? They brought right. me back with the rest of the cast, and I still stayed in Doofy. And then, you know, the, uh, somebody came up from the studio and said, you have to stop doing doofy. You're kind of freaking people out. you got to show them that you're not. They think that we're taking advantage of, like, a special ed guy. You know what I mean? Like, they, they, can you please tell them that you're not really, you know, totally 100% doofy? Because they're – I mean, look, I, I'm definitely doofy. There is – I am – I'm slightly special, right? But they sure. wanted to show me that I, I, I could attain a driver's license legally, you know? And so, like – because you're upsetting some of the actors, they think that you might that we're sort of taking advantage of a, of a guy like you. So, so at what point did you finally uh, become Dave? No, I had. That's when the studio came up at this. It was like the table read, you know. And oh god! Oh god! Gotcha. Kind of okay. Thing that they gotcha. said, you, you, you know, you got to sort of break character now gotcha. because table you're freaking okay. people out. They think that you know it's hilarious, but they think that we're taking advantage of. That's they think we really hired a, a guy because you know there was like the guy, the guy that played Corky on a uh, on a Life Goes On or whatever it was. Called. Right, right, know? right. Sure. So, that's, that's great. That's very funny. Anyway, hey Creech, Creech is not on, but he's going to listen to this. Let, this is not the Dave Sheridan interview hour. We don't need to chat about that. Let's, we are, you know, hey, it's been a pleasure, Craig. Uh, we're going to have you on again once you've shot the movie. Great. And you're on to talk about the shooting of it, and hopefully that will involve me as well. But, you know, right now it's all uh, full tilt, Indiegogo, full security. You're out to, you know, get the fans to um, help be a part of this movie in a real fun way. So if, you're, uh, if you love Danny Trejo and who doesn't, you know, log on to Indiegogo, uh, you know, put in the, the keyword Social Security the movie and um, give till it hurts so that Danny Trejo can put the hurting on the bad guys in Social Security the movie. All right, guys, welcome back. That is going to end it this week for the Dave and Creed show. 
want to thank Brian Daniels again for, for coming on and, yep, yep. and being my number two for this. Who knows, who knows if I'll return? He probably won't. No, but, probably not. But, you know, you never know. You're, that's you're, that's a good thing about this podcast is it's it's not predictable. Um, but, yeah, so we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you again for listening on WROM. Or if you're catching out the uncensored extended version, YouTube, Spreaker, iTunes, blah, 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 blah. We hope you enjoyed this week. Uh, we've got a great guest lined up for you next week. We're not going to reveal it yet. We'll save that reveal for a little later in the week. Hope you guys have a great weekend. If you're in America, happy 4th. If you're anywhere else outside of America, just have a good weekend. And we will talk to you next week on the Dave and Crete Show. Shut Shut up up and and sit sit down. down. Thank you for listening to the Dave and Crete Show. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of Dave and CJ. These views and opinions do not necessarily represent those of Creature Creator Productions or any of its affiliates.